In the chem activity number 21 and the corresponding video, we'll be looking at the reaction of halogens with alkenes, or halogenation reactions, or pi bonds as nucleophiles where the electrophile is a halogen. Now at first, it might surprise you that a halogen can serve as an electrophile, that is a diatomic halogen. So for instance, I've written out here diatomic chlorine, diatomic bromine, and diatomic iodine. As we know, these are nonpolar bonds. So it's not clear where there may be, for instance, a delta positive. Now I like to use an analogy. Assume that you're carrying a tub full of water, and as you walk, the water sloshes back and forth. And if you can think of the water as representing electron density, so at any one point we could have an excess of electron density on one side, and then a paucity of electron density on the other. Further, if there's a nucleophile in the vicinity, that can influence the sloshing back and forth. So at any one point, we can assume that there's a temporary polarization. And so we can assume, for instance, that there's a delta negative on one side and a delta positive on the other side of that diatomic chlorine molecule. Delta negative, delta positive, and delta negative, and delta positive. Now this temporary polarization can then get reversed and temporarily the delta negative would be on the opposite side. So it's just to say that indeed these halogens can serve as electrophiles. Now typically we don't see these reactions with diatomic fluorine and in part it's because these other halogens are larger and therefore they're more easily polarizable, more easy for the electrons to slosh back and forth. So now let's start to investigate the reaction. We're going to first of all look at the reaction of bromine with an alkene. And I'd like you to assume that in the case of our diatomic bromine, the electrons have sloshed to the left. And so that would suggest that there would be a delta negative on the left-hand side of that molecule. That would mean there would be a delta positive on the right-hand side. So our pi system is acting as a nucleophile and would be attracted to this particular bromine. And so I'm showing the curved arrow for that attack. And if this was similar, for instance, to the other reactions that we have seen, the hydrohalogenation and the acid-catalyzed addition of water and alcohols, we would then just assume that a bond would be broken and a bromide would leave. But as it turns out, there's evidence that there's something else that happens indeed here. And that is a back attack. So a pair of electrons attacks back at the, one of the carbons that was participating in the pi bond. As a result, we form this cyclical bromonium ion or halonium ion. So this would also apply if this was chlorine or iodine. And so you can see the ring structure represented right here. If we do a calculation of formal charge, we would actually say that the bromine has a positive formal charge. But understand that electron density is being pulled away from the carbons. And in some ways, it's helpful to think of this carbon right here as representing an incipient carbocation. So it's not a complete carbocation because we've got this ring structure. But there's this positiveness to that particular carbon. Now, why did I pick that carbon? Well, of course, that carbon is more substituted. It would be a more stabilized incipient carbocation. Now, I've represented that triangular ring in this way so that you could actually see it. But more often, we actually represent it in this fashion. That is, we keep all the bonds in the plane that we have in our original structure. And, and recall that uh, about these carbons where we have the carbon-carbon double bond, that's going to be trigonal planar. So we keep that sort of representation and then we show that indeed this bromonium ion has formed. And one of the things that we can do, therefore, is to show that it's going away from us. And I'll draw the bromine like this and a positive charge. Equally, it's possible, of course, to have this scenario where the bromine would be coming up at us. So either way will be fine. And in fact, it's important to consider that both can happen. So you'll see going forward, often we'll represent the bromonium ion as I have just drawn in these two examples here. As a last point, we should also mention that the mechanism details that we will have a bromide ion in the vicinity. 
And so the bromide ion is involved in the next step. In the next step, the bromide ion will be acting as a nucleophile, as we've seen with other reactions. Now the bromide will be attacking specifically at the more substituted carbon. Okay, so that's going to happen for sure. And so that pertains to the regioselectivity. So as it turns out, this addition is Markovnikov. That is, the attack of the nucleophile at this stage is going to happen at the more substituted carbon. Now, of course, if we're only adding two bromines, it's hard to tell that it's Markovnikov. And you'll see in later examples where we have a different nucleophile, it is clear that the nucleophile at this stage is adding to the more substituted carbon. So that's one decision that we need to make about what's going to happen next. The next decision that we need to make is, from which side will the bromide be attacking? So you can see what I've drawn here are the two versions of the bromonium ion, either with the bromine below the plane of that triangular planar portion, or above the plane of the triangular planar portion. And as you might imagine, it's going to be easier for the bromide to attack from the opposite side of that triangular bromonium ion. And so, for instance, this is not going to happen, nor is this. So we say that the bromide will be attacking actually from only one side at that more substituted carbon, and it's the opposite side of where the bromonium ion already is. We refer to that sort of addition or nucleophile attack as an anti-attack, and ultimately it'll be an anti-addition. So therefore, only one product will form. And as you might imagine, the only one product in the first case will be this, and the only product in the second case will be this. Notice that the addition of these two halogens is that they're on the opposite side of the original structure. So certainly there's now rotation about the carbon-carbon sigma bond. So I'm just going to highlight there's still rotation about there. But in terms of comparing to the original structure, the bromines have added on opposite side. And certainly when we're working with rings, that becomes more obvious. What's not going to form is this nor this. So this reaction is referred to as being stereoselective. That is, there's a choice between two possible products that can form and predominantly only one forms. And it could be in fact as close as 100%. Now admittedly it might be possible for the other to form to a small amount, but predominantly it's one product over another. And, and note the relationship of these products are stereoisomers and therefore we say that this is a stereo selective reaction. And specifically, we refer to this as an anti-addition, or we say that it has anti-stereochemistry. Before we leave this slide, perhaps it's useful to comment on the relationship of the two products that form. And perhaps you can see, just in terms of how we've drawn, that indeed they are mirror images. So in this particular case, the two stereoisomers that form are enantiomers. Let's go on to look at a complete example of this mechanism where I'll start from scratch and draw it out completely and highlight the various stages. So in this example, you're asked to draw the complete mechanism, now with chlorine, and we'll show both stereoisomer products with the correct stereochemistry. So what I would encourage you to do is write out a chlorine dash chlorine and it's not necessary to write out all the lone pairs of electrons. Rather, I'm going to write out one pair that I know is going to be used in a sense for the back attack. And it's helpful to think, for instance, that the chlorine on the right in this case would be delta negative, and this chlorine on the left would be delta positive. So that's where the pi bond is going to attack. So this is a pi bond acting as a nucleophile. We have the back attack of our chlorine using the lone pair of electrons. And then, of course, we have this bond that's broken, which will release a chloride into solution. The intermediate that's generated as a result of this, and you're going to see that it's actually a little easier to look at this reaction when you're using these ring structures, is that I'm going to have now the chloronium ion. 
And I find it helpful actually to put the chloronium ion going back. But understand that the chloronium ion can also be going forward, if you will. Be sure to include the positive charge on that chlorine. Because if we do a formal charge calculation, that's where the positive charge resides. We also now have our chloride in solution. And note that the chloride is going to attack the more substituted carbon, and it's also going to attack from the opposite side of the chloronium ion. So you don't have to specifically label that that's from the top. You'll see as a result of the reaction coming from the top that that will determine the sort of product that we write so now I write the ring structure. And note, I'm viewing the ring structure as being in the plane of the page. So as a result of the chlorine coming in from the top on this carbon that's already got a methyl group, I'm going to show a chlorine like this. And of course, my methyl group will be going away. And in turn, the other chlorine will also be going away. So from the perspective of the ring, you can see that these chlorines are in the trans position. And this is as a result of this anti-addition. There is no possibility for the two chloral groups to be in the cis position. So this is why we say the reaction is stereoselective for that particular stereoisomer. But it doesn't mean that two stereoisomers can't form. So indeed, another stereoisomer will form. I'm not going to write out the mechanism for that, but perhaps you can imagine that if the chloronium ion had been pointing upwards, from the perspective of the plane of the ring, then the other product that we would form would be the following. So when you're asked to write the mechanism, it's generally okay to write the mechanism for only one of the stereoisomers that would form, but then predict what the second stereoisomer would be. So indeed, it would be this particular product. Again, the chloral groups are in transposition relative to one another. So this is what we mean by the correct stereochemistry. And I think if you were to adjust and rearrange, you would see that indeed these are mirror images. And so what we've done here is we have formed the enantiomers. Again, we say that this reaction has regiochemistry in the, in the sense that the nucleophilic attack at the intermediate is attacking at the more substituted carbon. So that's a Markovnikov addition. And secondly, it's stereoselective because we don't see any of the product in terms of the chloral groups being, being cis to one another. Mm -hmm.